Dear students, without making it too long, um, I will just complete uh, part two. And from now on, we will just focus on the um, uh, discussion board and trying to focus on the draft and so that we can actually learn on the discussion board itself rather than any more through lectures and so on. The same will be on the campus. We will be actually going to the discussion board and we will be um, learning through examples on the um, on Learn 9. So here we go. So uh, this is the um, the video I spoke about, uh, or the, the whole article that I spoke about in part one. So I would like you to actually, if you don't have time to actually watch the whole video, I'm, I'm sure it's not too long. And I've given a link in the announcement. But basically the idea here is, as I spoke before, what they said, you, we, we don't have a, there's no such a thing like a dictionary in the brain. What there is is just connections, associations and networks, right? So the idea that you will flash a card and the child will say, oh, keys, oh, this, or oh, that, and then they will spell it and all of that. True, true. If you, if you teach them like a chimp, even a chimp after a while will spell keys in the right way. But this is not what we're after. Right? What we're after is actually those higher order thinking skills that the curriculum speaks about <clears throat> in terms of the capabilities, in terms of the priorities, and in terms also of those uh, of the outcomes that we discuss in part one, which are all these complex skills, like ability to really live in a complex world, which is what these um, uh, uh, I call them outcomes, but they basically learning content um, um, actually uh, articulate. OK, so here it is. Um, so what we also said in the last in part one was that we're after large tasks, right? And we're after large tasks um, in um, our teaching because they offer opportunities for students to construct integrated meaning systems. And what is integrated meaning systems is actually systems like this, <clears throat> right? So large tax, tasks offer students opportunity to um, draw on the associations they already have in the brain and through explorations that actually uh, probe different as different types of associations they have and basically link what before was not linked and as a result they actually rewire or reorganize information so large tasks were, were after resources students need examples from life and they also need access to people so those this will be not just uh, say different types of materials but they also will be people as well and each other, of course. But people, people are resources and tools for information management. So what did I say? Students need to approach, uh, pardon me, students need to approach their learning from what they know and what they don't know. Right. So when they manage, when we give them tools for information management, what they will be doing is um, playing with information in one way, another way, and another way, and as a result, developing those associations, but from the questions, from the perspective of the question that actually makes sense in relation to their brain, not to my brain as a teacher, right? Because how I see things and how I define them as objects of learning is a different thing than what it looks like to the student. <clears throat> So you already in in other in, in module four you have examples of how to construct uh, a unit of work and you also have um, um, in in announcements you had a podcast where I was actually talking about student engagement and I was showing different ways of how to do it. So basically, what I want to do is today is actually illustrate to you how you could 
make your assignment one work for you. And now if, if your assignment one didn't actually create a table or didn't do it as well as you could have, then it doesn't matter. You can actually explore portfolios of other students and see wh what uh, students actually had maybe a better explanation of their um, literacy activity. Or actually, if you view many students learning um, activities, you might actually put something uh, very meaningful for yourself. So um, explore what other students had in assignment one, and then I will show you how to draw on it. So overall, what we want to do is to create a situation where through the engagement and through explorations and of the world and through students developing their own relationship to their things with the things that they will be exploring, students will be inspired to a project, right? So we don't front up in, in you know in the classroom and say today we're gonna do this, today we're gonna do that, or you guys will be doing posters. And they go, oh yeah. And when they're five, that might be okay. But when they're 13, they really want to engage with the world and they would find this kind of pedagogy not uh, meaningful to them. So doing a poster might be a great thing, but when it didn't come out from them, from their understanding of the world, then it's actually meaningless and they might not actually get the most out of it. So the first thing, but I would like to do is when you think of actually inspiring students to engage in some something large and create to create a project, right? So we want to create project. Now, so um, <clears throat> students are not aware yet what project, and, and and you might not actually know yourself whether you they would do this or that. I mean, same resources might be for might be used. The same exploratory sort of um, conditions might actually lead to any of those um, tasks. I mean, think of others. Uh, I just included here the Rachel's example when she talked about engaging students in the Skype conversations, but you know, creating Pecha Kutia presentations, which are about um, engaging in, in dialogues about things that actually people want to talk about. And five-year-olds can do it, and 15-year-olds can do it. So, um, yes. So, the question really is, in terms of resources, what do you do? What do you do? What do you draw on in order to inspire students to do, to want to do a lot, to engage, to want to engage in a large task, in uh, in a larger project, to create something. How, what do you, what resources do you use? So, so we all have seen this table one in one way or another, right? So just to make sure, I am using the Australian curriculum because up to the foundation, as from foundation year, uh, <clears throat> Australian curriculum in Darwin is. Uh, uh, is what is used, but I'm very happy for, for students who are in early childhood, like earlier years, to refer to other policy documents like early years learning framework. <clears throat> so we had a class uh, on campus, you know, in the beginning of the semester, and we were thinking about, say, an activity, and Sharon has suggested that she reads a book to her daughter. So I thought I might just today take that activity in order to show you how to draw on the things you've done for assignment one in for assignment two. So remember the question is what type of resources would you include in order to inspire children to want to do a particular project? If I were to continue with the example of reading to someone, right, reading to someone, then what we did in module one, we were thinking, and, and then also module two helped us with it to make it a little bit more sophisticated. We were thinking what is actually involved in an activity of reading things to someone. Right, what we were thinking. So we were thinking quite a lot about it. So we were trying to use the uh, the understanding of the understandings which come from the in, um, priorities, which is the indigenous link, Asian link, and community building or sustainability. It's a, it's a sustainability could be science, but it 
could also refer to community building. Right? We want we want children to actually be uh, built and see themselves as part com of a community. Then we have also those values. Then we also had this table here, but I will want you to actually refer to it. Um, sorry, it's not very visible. I'll just make it like this and maybe I'll show it. Right. So you have this table and I, I will place this document on the announcement so you can see it again. I would want you to actually refer to it and just see whether it inspires you a little bit, whether you can draw on it. But anyway, so what happened? There's an activity of reading to someone. And my question really is, how can you use the curriculum and the priorities, capabilities, and also the language um, literacy and uh, literature strand or structure of the strand? How can you use it to actually critically think what is involved in reading. And here's that sometimes uh, students say, well, what does it mean critically? Well, what it means that no longer you have yourself only to think what reading, an activity of reading might involve, because you would say, well, it might involve this and this, and you pull these things out of, you know, straw hat. <clears throat> what we have is the curriculum and, where is the curriculum? Um, Where's the curriculum? What we have is the curriculum. So we have um, we have capabilities and priorities. And then I, I actually just <coughs> looked at the foundation here. So this is the structure. I still, again, we'll have to do this to make things visible. So we have this, or this is this is the more detailed, but it's pretty much the same as that, right? So this is the the kind of structure of the language, literature, and literacy strand, and those things are then reflected also in here, what they what they call content. And you've listened to my um, part once, so I will no longer address the, the the thing about the content, what it what it actually means in the way how I read it. Now, if you want complex skills like um, context of, you know, indigenous context in uh, Asian links and also community building uh, aspects, and also if you want the capabilities and the, these complex um, skills here, if you want them actually, if you want students to actually gain control over these aspects of literacy, you actually need to support it, right? You need to support it, not teach it necessarily, because I don't know what that would mean, but, but your environment, the, the, the learning conditions that you create for your students, uh, they need to support it. You cannot assess students unless you actually supported the, the learning of these complex skills. And now remember that since no skill, like no word, lives in isolation, right? All skills are learned in relation to one another. You can't do commu community building <clears throat> or integrate indigenous knowledges or connections without things like diversity, um, And also reference, make references to things you know and probably also things you don't know and everything here that we discussed, right? So what I did was I actually drew on all these headings here because they are repeated in the curriculum structure of, uh, of that strand. And, and I have explicated them in here. Now, I probably didn't do them all. But here's the structure, what I did. In order for you or for a teacher to understand what a, an activity of reading text to someone actually involves, I use those headings from the strand and also the concern with indigenous, Asian and community building aspects to actually think what needs to be, what kind of resources need to be uh, provided by the literacy environment, by the literacy classroom, 
in order to satisfy all that complexity which is explicated in the curriculum. So as we discussed in module one and module two, if you would like, or rather if in order to support that complexity, so for example, in relation to language change, and in terms of the critical and creative capabilities, I am really concerned here with the range, right? What kind of range of resources do you make available for students to explore in order to build complex understandings? Because even a detail like punctuation, or if you really want to think of grammar, all of this makes only sense in the larger context of use. So what did I write here? If you are thinking about, if you are, if you are thinking of the choice of text that you need to actually make available to students in order for them to develop complex understandings. It looks like in terms of language change, I say identify and make available, right? And make available. I didn't write it because it was uh, the same to me. Text that illustrate a range of dialects, not only that, um, language change through time so you could do you could use English here but so you look at the, a range of dialects because uh, language change through time so you can show people to people to students you text with old English you know stories created and spoken using old English and also different forms of English so different forms of English are not necessarily dialect. So um, hmm, it's a really it's a really tricky here without in insulting anyone, which I don't mean to. So what we have different kinds of dialects. So we have English, say, you know, we have Australian English, we have American English, we have Sco Scottish English, we have all, all so many Englishes right all around the world, and we also have the, maybe not le not as much um, uh, visible. But we have different English used in different contexts, like say, um, say, a bit more formal English, and then we so so people who speak an academic English they actually explic, uh, you know express themselves differently as opposed to a sort of what people call the broad Australian. But we also have different fo forms of English. And, you know, so they're not necessarily dialects, but they're something like what I produce, you know, accented English. We have Indian English, and I'm not quite sure whether Indian English belongs to the dialects or not, but they use English almost like their own language because it actually uh, allows people from different areas of India to actually in, uh, talk to each other. So it's an accented English, it's Indian English. Um, so yeah, so we have many many forms of English. As uh, actually, our colleague uh, Professor Kuyuli, who is um, an adjunct professor in our university, in our School of Education, what she calls pluri Englishes, right? And I can al almost see your eyes here going like as if it wasn't hard enough to just read to children a fairy tale. What am I gonna do with all of that? That's gonna confuse them. Well, that's one way to look at things, right? Um, as if reading to students fairy tale was even was ever that simple. So some students might think, "Oh my God, if it was difficult, then what about this?" Well, let's let's first let's do the first step step first, right? If we want to actually do things with the curriculum, then we need to follow it. So the the first thing th first things come first. So what we want to know first is what does the reading activity actually involve? So it involves language change. And look at this. Here I'm looking at the range, but here I'm looking at impact and personal and social, I call it meaning, right? I call it meaning just to make everything really um, to the point and, and just brief so that you can actually see the difference. So in terms of ethical and cultural capabilities, and as you know, the way I'm working with them, I'm looking for the impact, right? So what we want, the reason why we actually are doing all of that exercise, selecting different resources, because what we want is our students to actually develop a particular mindset. We want them to know that there is no one way to speak English. 
uh, that that way will depend on the location, on the region, will also depend on the genre, as I was talking about the broad English, working class English, and it's not working class as such, but it is a working context. If, so different different contexts have different forms of language, so let's call them genres. We have different dialects or different forms of English from different, you know, and then we also have um, different English use in different contexts, like for comedy, you know, so in, com in comedy sketches, people play with different types of um, dialects or different forms of English in newspaper poetry uses also makes a play. Um, different membership group, but membership groups have their own dialects as well, their way, their own way of speaking and uh, using English. So, so there is no one English. And what I also would like, actually, so the ethical impact or cultural impact of of the of the of the, um, of the uh, uh, content or what will we call it, content or outcome, uh, is that. English is not the only language used by people in Australia, right? So there's not only dialects, there's not only membership groups, there's not only different genres, uh, but there's also different people. There are people like me, uh, there are migrants, and there are people like me who actually speak more than just English. So even though we're in here, where we belong to accented English, but we also have other languages as well. So there so we want that so i've done this analysis for a, a number of these um, content areas language for interaction so here you might reflect for yourselves what literacy about what literacy practices are there for enriching engagements with others? Now, this is totally meaningless, right? Um, it's very abstract because I wrote it. But basically, in this uh, place, you might think to yourselves, if you are considering reading to others, what are the contexts in which we read to others? <laughs> Right, we read to others. And if you're thinking that maybe as a result of the explorations that your students will do, they might actually be inspired to produce any of those tasks here, then maybe you could show them what a multimodal book could look like. Well, you could create one before, uh, so um, you'd have an example. You could actually find maybe some on the internet. There are some uh, that I have seen. So, you know, so you give students a bit of a uh, overview, like what, what's happening? People make multimodal books. Oh my God, right? Uh, so that's really lovely. If you, so, so you give students an idea that these things are done. If you want students to um, create a resource about their own learning to help children to catch up, right? You could actually, this is the time when you actually call on your own resources, like your own children or friends of friends and whatever. So uh, what would be interesting is to create snapshots of students going and, and uh, documenting their own learning in the literacy classroom. And they know that they do it in order to actually support other children and you could actually maybe find some examples on on the web on the web but you could actually use previous classrooms or ask your children your own children to do some sort of little bit of snapshots of this and that um, so that the children that are actually investigating in the engagement phase right when they're investigating what the world can looks like what do people do how do they do it why they do it when they do it they would be exposed to something like, oh my goodness, you could actually report on your own learning and show to other children how you learn, talk them through it, take them through the play, show them the outcome. This is amazing. So children in the hospital could actually follow your own steps or the steps of the children in the classroom. And they could actually now have fun by learning as they are watching other children learning, right? But you need to show it to children because they can't invent that whole thing by themselves. C 
create a website. Now, even I'm, I'm always thinking of five year olds. So even though you are um, going to teach the whole range of children, what I'm really saying that a lot of uh, things that you can actually allow children to explore might sound really like for 18 year olds, but really um, a website is not necessarily, doesn't have to necessarily look like Microsoft m m magic, right? It can actually look basically like a page in a book where we have things that are meaningful to us. So you can actually show to students. And this is the time when you actually do spend a little bit of uh, your energy to actually create something yourself or Maybe your school already has an example, or maybe there is one somewhere on the net. I don't know. But these are the sort of things that I'm trying to inspire you to think of when it comes to the kinds of resources you would make uh, available to your students in order for them to actually understand or develop an understanding what language for interaction actually means, especially in the context of a learning uh, of, of, a, of a literacy activity like reading to others, right? Because that's what we're trying to understand. We're trying to understand what reading to others means. And we're going through all the uh, outcomes to actually now um, develop a meaning. And you can see that these outcomes are now trying, uh, are helping us to develop a multi-dimensional understanding of an activity reading to others, right? Not just in one way. Oh, here it is, I'm reading to you. Here it is, reading to others. And what are you reading? Seuss, Dr. Seuss, all right. So, uh, or Caterpillar or something. That's, that's, that's not sophisticated. That's just what nannies do. Okay, so, um, so language for interaction. Oh my God, and examples like this, right? When children see how much you can do with text and how much you can create in order to actually interact with people in more than one way for many purposes and many of them actually quite relevant to children's life. Yes, the children do go to hospitals or uh, things happen, you know, there are aged care communities where people feel lonely. I don't know, lots of things happen and, in or, and it would be very lovely to show to students how we could actually engage with those people through reading. Some examples I gave you. So what did I show here? So this was like the range, right? So I showed you the range. You can do this, you can do that. But in terms of the impact, what do we have here? So through all these examples, through the different range of situations what you, that you will provide students with, it is important that students now explore the link between the forms of literacy and what they can do with them, right? What they can do with them. Actually, I wrote it here. What is the function of text-based communication, right? But now when you saw this multimodal book or helping children to catch up with their learning if they're in hospital, you get a pretty rich idea now that this is possible. So students explore the link between the form of literacy so reading to others and what it allows them to achieve. So, um, so different forms of reading to others. Now, why did I write here from nowhere it popped out? I'll just make it a different color. Um, I can make a different color, it didn't come up. So I'll just make it um, something else like bold. When would you measure space by songs? Remember, uh, I mean, I know very, I know very little about indigenous knowledges, but I know that every school has a, or well, at least in Darwin, schools have cultural officers. So those people will help you to create links with the community, and you can bring community to classroom. Uh, but that that stuff I already have explained in uh, my other videos about how to create a unit of work. Here I'm just talking about the range of texts, and and how do we actually critic, how do we uh, know what texts uh, to use and how. So here. When would you measure uh, space by songs? Remember indigenous people, at least in one of the videos, uh, and they make fun of it, but basically when they had to 40,000 years ago or 20,000 years ago, when actually there was some time, I think it was 20,000 years ago, Australia stopped being really um, a, a lush country. It actually became a desert, right? It wasn't always a desert. 40, 50,000 years ago, Australia was not a desert. And then actually it became, really, uh, you know, a lot of indigenous people died because it was a really tough climate. 
and then in order to actually maintain uh, themselves and maintain connections you know like if you wanted to have children you couldn't actually marry your father so you had to connect at particular time in particular places so you had to cross deserts you have to find each other and so on so they didn't have GPS, right? So there were different ways in which people were actually identifying themselves in space and time. So one of them was uh, measuring space by songs, right? So you have particular songs. So if you sing the song so many times, you will be there. And this brings us to that cultural impact, which is when we actually include some resources here, I want you to think of the types of resources that will show to students or at least make it visible to them that literacy has many faces, that literacy is a cultural uh, invention and that without literacy we can't do lots of things, right? So those things like reading are obvious, right? Uh, they, they will be apparent throughout the, um, your lessons. But here, we're learning that people actually have to read the land, right? They had to read the land. And remember, we were talking about uh, that the literacy practices change through time. So, um, yes, they were reading the land in a particular way. Another way that people used to have, or indigenous people used to have to read the land and to connect it to their life stories was of course through paintings, right? Paintings, indigenous paintings are not paintings. They're not the same as say in the West where we paint our feelings or paint historical events. Here it is also not just a historical event, but it's for people to actually locate, locate themselves and their stories on the map that their drawing actually reflects. And then you can, of course, um, uh, introduce other devices for locating ourselves in time and space. And in that way, you can illustrate that there are diff different forms of language that we have invented as, 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 as a whole global society. Mind you, I don't know how they do it in the Amazon. Um, you know, for actually reading the land. So it's not like that the Google Maps is better than an Aboriginal painting. Each does its own job. And when students are introduced to it, they might actually in their own projects now play a little bit with it, right? So that they might actually, instead of using actually um, Google Maps, they might actually start expressing themselves through the indig using indigenous symbols and locating stories which they want to say using actually indigenous ways. Language for interaction also refers to different types of alphabet. So um, in my this, um, podcast or lessons where I actually talk about how to actually create a unit of work, I do refer, and you might have already listened to it, how you can actually engage other languages and how it is actually necessary. You do it for fun, but you also do it for meditational purposes like calligraphy. Uh, but students need to actually play a bit and learn and use um, different types of alphabet. Now, I'll just be quick just to digress here a little bit. So uh, how to do it, You, I probably, oops, this is something else, this is the indigenous thing. Uh, I probably showed it before in my other lessons, but you know, if your students produce a text um, of any sort, anywhere, and they want to be cool, inclusive, they want to make the website or they want the audiobook to be also understandable for people of other languages, so that you can, they, can, they can produce an audiobook or, or a multi-modal book uh, in English. Uh, but they would want to actually include other languages. So there you go. This is you type it in English, you get it in uh, Vietnamese, for example. That is if I find it. Right, that's it. It's already on their website. And in class, you actually can do this. I, I've shown it in, on campus, but you can actually, you know, you can do this. Remove Google and then 
remove that. Oops, sorry. That. And you will learn how in Vietnamese people say free, free service. Free service. There you go. Or maybe, or maybe just free. There you go. And because you've got here the speech, you know, you can actually um, hear how people actually in Vietnamese pronounce it. So not only not only you can so you, you can actually record it or actually you can make your students learn how to pronounce it. Now when they under eleven, they should be actually flying through it, right? Because um, it's quite uh, easy, uh, easier for children under the age of 11 years old uh, to actually learn to pronounce things without an accent. So that's great, right? They can actually record themselves reading their own uh, text which they produced for the website or for some other book and so on. And that's just fun. It's hysterical, it's fun, and they will love it and they will be showing it off. But very, the very fact that they can actually take a text like this and put it here and instantly have a multilingual website. And I know that Google doesn't translate it very well, but who cares? That looks way better than if you and I did that without a dictionary or even with a dictionary, right? It is instantaneous and makes it all cool. So there. So I produced here some more things like, so remember that whatever is in here talks about the range of text, whatever is here talks about the impact, cultural impact, right? So I, in text in context, so what I'm saying here, expand students' lived experience of the relationship. I just wait, I have to read it for myself. Okay, so what, do I, what I should have had here is expand students' experiences. So basically what we want the student is to learn or explore. So we, we basically provide examples, provide examples uh, illustrating the relationship between text and their purpose. So here I'm talking about include a range of genres, symbols, culture diverse writing practices. So it looks very complex to you, right? Because it says like, so what do I do? Do I do it in one single unit of work? No, but what I'm saying is, um, well, yes and no. What I'm saying is when you create a unit of work and that unit of work, I suggest, should be, it is helpful if you base it around a particular literacy activity. And here we were looking at reading to others and before you go on and create an exploratory phase for students so that to inspire them to do a project, what I'm trying to do is for you to think about um, what reading to others actually implies, what is involved, so that when you create forms of engagement for your students, whether it is through the puzzle, or whether it is from some other forms of engagement that I actually explained to you in the podcast a couple of weeks ago, that you actually know what to put there and why, so that your lessons and the materials you use and therefore the forms of meaning making, the symbols that your students use, are not really narrow and dare I say, a monolingual, monocultural, kind of abstract. In fact, in fact, when you allow students in access to a richer number of resources, and when you actually make them, uh, you choose them and make them available, first you need to choose them. And if you choose them by understanding all these aspects that I'm talking here about, then your learning resource and the, and the things on which in relation to which students will be building their understanding, oh my God, this world is so big, so many things, so many things to play with, right? So all of a sudden now children actually are learning that they have toys to play with, to do things. All of a sudden tasks become doable, which is 
quite different than to than drilling children to a myopic understanding of what is happening in a particular story, right? So what does this word say? What does this word say? Well, first of all, why did the particular sentence start this way or not another way? Why did the next sentence start this particular way, not another way, right? What is the relationship with the second sentence and the first sentence? How do you explain it, right? So the only way that you can actually en enable children to develop such complex understandings and therefore become good readers and become, become good writers is when we ourselves understand how much is involved in a particular activity, make text, make text and tools available. And this is an exercise for us to think about it, what, what to include. So remembering that texts actually come in context, right? So what would that mean? So there's nothing written in stone that I've written here because things, you know, evolve and um, I could, I use the curriculum as much as I could, but there's, uh, people say curriculum is overloaded, but it actually doesn't have enough information, in fact. So what I wrote here, that t so, so this is the range, like you show different types of writing and all of that. Um, but here, in terms of impact, I was thinking to myself, forms of analysis. Uh, okay, so basically you need to, so for students to actually make the link between the text and purpose, they need some forms of uh, tools for analysis, right? And the curriculum actually somewhere does say some word analysis of an evaluation. I don't know, I don't have it here. I might just have a look. So it's here, right? So it is there, um, interpreting, analyzing, evaluating. So in order for students, for children or for students to actually make the link between, to actually understand the link between the text and context, right? To actually explore, explore, because they all understand, they already speak English, they all understand it, but they actually, they do not understand it critically. So what, what we have to do is provide them with a range of things and then actually use some tools, develop some tools that allow ch students to actually create a link be between a particular text and the way it actually manipulates people and the values from which this particular text is coming. So um, I, of course, offered you my own analysis, which is, you know, the, st the, the, the structure of the text and the emotions, and that allows students to actually reflect on such links and, and, and identify strategies with which um, readers manipulate or manipulate readers. I mean, the writers manipulate readers. Yes, people say meaning, make, make meaning. I don't know what make meaning means. This is such an innocent, neutral word. Actually, text always manipulates because when you speak, you actually go after an, Im you are after an impact, right? You always manipulate the reader. And manipulate doesn't mean actually negatively. You uh, doesn't mean anything negative necessarily, right? But we always act strategically. Now, there was, there was a good point made in the last collaborate session by um, Rosalind, when she actually said, and then in order to actually truly assess this link between um, text and purpose and to reveal values, what Rosalind said, so then when you provide a text, choose also a range of texts that will allow students to detect those values, right? So example that we had in the collaborative session on the 6th of, uh, of, of May, on the Friday, was a reporting of a car accident, right? So a member of a obviously wealthy or at least well doing well uh, Greek family uh, died in the car accident, someone hit him and so on. And obviously the, 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 the article was written with um, sadness and a sense of loss. Uh, but uh, Rosalind asked, I wonder whether uh, a same sort of uh, uh, empath sense of empathy would be coming if it was an indigenous person or if it was a homeless person, right? So what, what happens now if you used 
my uh, tools of analysis, which would allow you to, step by step to analyze actually how what emotions is the text actually trying to evoke in the reader. You could actually identify this way what values this text is actually presenting. Now, um, obviously, we we have our limits, and when we work with texts from different um, communities, whether um, uh, based in Austra communities which 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 are English speaking or communities which are also um, Asian speaking or indigenous communities, then we really need some um advice right that's why having exposure to a greater range of text builds a, a cultural uh, expertise uh, because just trying to actually see how one text does it it's not telling us much um about how the text and, and their purpose actually are linked together so now, this is a bit different the way I speak here, so you, you'll just find it a bit different, but in a, in, in, I am an academic and I just can't talk about text structure as grammar or something else. So I spoke about that structure that I have for analyzing text through emotions, so that's one sort of tool of analysis you could actually provide students with. So what I'm talking here about is provide students with tools, enabling them to identify patterns that serve them, right? So they need to identify patterns that enable them to actually critically engage with the text and, and also uh, cons uh, constructively. So this is the range. What range? Because this is the table, right? Critical and creative is about the range. Sorry. <laughs> so... Um, so what range? So you need. So I'm not saying just explain to them words and vocabulary because that would be nonsense. Reducing word text to words and vocabulary, it's like saying that human being is um, uh, legs and hairs on them, right? Something like that. Anyway, so thinking of genre, this is my structure of a, uh, my, my 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 tools of analysis uh, for analyzing structure for linking structure with emotions. Tools for exploring intonation and word order. Now, uh, I've, I've explained it quite nicely in the collaborate session on the 6th of May. So you should actually watch it because actually we, we don't actually pay attention to the good expression because we think that the students will create well grammatically constructed sentences based on uh, grammar. This is a nonsense. The grammar doesn't exist really. I'm sorry for that. It's, it does exist, but not in the way of how we talk about it. We live grammar, we are structured by grammar, but grammar is just like words. It's not just one piece of information. It lives throughout your brain and it's connected to your gestuality. It's connected to your to, to, to your rhythms. You become it. That's why English people do not have to think about English grammar because they are it, right? So what I did do is showed how intonation and, and intonation uh, tools can actually assist students with developing a, a, bit, a, a better sense of word order, uh, a paragraph, how to structure a paragraph and, and make things actually appear logically. So, um, so there is a particular tendency of going from important to less important in English, so from left to right. And as I was saying before to you, things like what follows next, what follows next, what follows next, what follows next in a sentence and also how paragraphs are linked together are always linked back to the main referent, which is the most important thing in the beginning of the paragraph or in the beginning of a sentence. So that would be a nice thing to actually integrate. So analyze the patterns of emotions, analyze, link them with intonation. Um, so what do we have here? Tools for exploring what else is in text. Yes, and it could be, it could be, you know, students actually having access to flexible, uh, the tools. We could use tools in a way that allow students to have some flexibility, which means link um, grammar with uh, particular ways of expressing emotions and how punctuation looks like, right? So not just one thing. 
because what we want is students to develop a literate disposition and that's again a complex um, a complex set of set of associations and the only way they can actually do it is when they compare one form of one pattern with another pattern with another pattern and then they can actually build those associations gradually obviously they will do it for you much faster if you said to them this word means this and they will not be able to actually create a story out of it or uh, create anything in a in a coherent and lovely way but they will be able if you say to them do you see a horse how do you spell horse we've trained this horse the way to spell horse is like this we've done it 300 times well you know they will do that but they will not become literate people because this kind of pedagogy doesn't actually teach them literacy it teaches them to recognize and reproduce recognize and reproduce recognize and reproduce right it's a kind of reward system you did it we we'll give you a lolly okay so when we so that was the range remember about the range think of a range of analytical systems i have invented my own i have given you so i have invented the ones here with emotions so i so that's my invention and i also invented the one here with intonation tools for exploring intonation the logic of text organization so these are my ones um yes i'm looking for different ways because um yes the words and grammar thing is just just insufficient so I wrote here something quite abstract here about the purpose, which is the impact of it, enabling students to use the tools to relate elements to values, right? So to relate, you know, the, the, the patterns that they find this about um, the structure of the text to values and cultural purposes of text. Now I wrote here something really weird for you, but it, I will just read it out. Aesthetic tools must be included as artistic texts are not a, an excuse to teach grammar and vocabulary right aesthetic tools so um if you read to children any story right and you do all this uh so so when when, when you analyze with students uh, a text it's very important not only to do the things that i here mention but texts are especially the text that uh, people use in uh, schools are written by actually important authors right <laughs> dr seuss was not Anya lion he actually his text and, and and i'm just mentioning him because you will not be using just uh, uh australian anglo-saxon sort of stories because that would be actually sad if you did but uh, if you reduce literacy to just that but what i'm saying is every text has their own uh, um, aesthetic uh, is, is, is constructed in a particular way to generate in the reader not just a, an emotion but also an aesthetic experience so the rhymes and all kinds of things that happen in the text particular word choices emotions through particular word choices um, are very important that they actually as um, considered right so that you do not hurry through the text and basically say oh well you got the words you got the grammar and we just move on but those texts are written by master but by masters and they provide us with a richness but we shouldn't just hurry through we should actually have a look let's have a look at different ways how people focus the the story how, how people focus the story what what emotion how was this emotion expressed right what words i use would you think of those words right what other words are there what other texts use what words they use right let's compare a newspaper article with a uh, a lovely whether you do a novel or you do a, an emotional speech by some by some uh, political figure and so on let's have a look what words they were using also um when when a text is well written by a master or an expert person it has a rhythm it actually flows you could almost almost fall asleep to it it has this such a, a soothing and rhythmic bal balance uh, it's important that you actually show it to students that you actually in, uh, include it as part of the text analysis of the tools that the text or the writer uses 
So what else do we have? Expressing and developing ideas. Examples, so including exa to include examples illustrating a range between genre, event, purpose. Okay, so I know what I meant here. This is totally, totally abstract, right? Um, I probably wrote, wrote this text for myself. So expressing and developing ideas. So notice that they couldn't do that unless they actually, and that's why I actually ordered them in this sort of uh, way, these things because they can't express and develop ideas until they actually went through some form of analysis and the analysis also of the context in terms of values as well. And they did understand that, that um, texts have communicative value and so on. So right, so they had to actually um, get through all of this before we get to the point where we actually um, develop in students an awareness that um, we use text in, in, you know, in order to express and develop ideas. So they've done all of this analysis and so on. Now they have actually tools to express ideas and, and develop, uh, to express and develop ideas. Now, because it's an Australian curriculum, and as I said, because Australian curriculum and this, uh, is kind of um, NAPLAN driven and all of that, um, which is a little bit sad, but not every semester is committed to NAPLAN, so you do have sometimes semester two to play and actually do the real things. Well, you should be doing this for NAPLAN too, but, but you know, develop and express ideas. But remember when we were doing things like comedy? So what I'm saying to you is now, that in order for students to understand a genre, they have to actually understand many genres. There's no way that a person can understand the meaning of anything through in and of itself, through that particular object. Because if you are in the dark, that's all you see. You see nothing, right? You cannot actually understand the dark color if you have never seen any other color. So the same here. When we so when we talk about expressing and develop developing ideas, what I want you to consider is not all of these analysis that we have done here, but the thing that I mentioned probably in module two, which is when you want to do persuasive text, remember what you do? You actually you actually try to put so persuasion is created by uh, evoking in, in your audiences a sense of logic, right? So, uh, so this, is my, this is not a very happy expression I used here, but what I'm saying is when people, uh, when people uh, create an ad, right, and they put a woman on the car, and you know, make her hair flow and all that stuff. There is nothing particularly logical about hoping that the car will sell as a result. But people pull out of their life's experiences different forms of the things that work or logics, and now they use it in order to persuade someone to have a buy a car or stop drinking in a particular poster, or uh, they want to uh, convince them to a particular point of view. And sometimes you convince people to a particular point of view, not necessarily by uh, drawing on their logic or, or trying to address to their logic, but very often, and actually probably it's the best argument, is when you actually appeal to their fears, right? Well, and, and in, in every nation and every culture has that sort of thing. So what do they say? It's better the devil you know, right? So let's vote for, like, I'm just thinking of American elections. Let's vo vote for Hillary because we already know her. I mean, she's the devil, but we know that devil, right? So, yep. So that's, that's, that's how actually persuasive tax works. It doesn't work by becoming an Einstein. It actually... You have to be a Machiavelli, <laughs> if I can put it this way. And then with a comedy sketch, what is it that we, we show? We, I use the comedy sketch on purpose to, to actually contrast. So that you, in order for you to understand better how persuasive text works, I actually use com comedy sketch because I showed you that comedy sketch works in the opposite way. You don't actually create logic at any um 
um, right? You're not actually after logic. What you do, you bring people to a particular level. They think they understand what you're saying. They kind of, their brain is already creating because that's how comprehension works. Actually, it's very funny. We're more ahead of time than we ever actually realize. And the brain knows what you will do before you know what you will do. And that's wonderful because otherwise we would be dead many times. Um, so what happens is we bring people to a particular, in a, in a comedy situation, we bring the audiences to a particular moment where they actually know what should happen and we go the other way. Right, so so welcome to the, to hell. Remember the sketch with um, uh, with Mr. Bean. So welcome to hell. Some of you might notice that I am that this is hell and and I am the devil. But you can call me and what you're thinking, like Lucifer or something, Toby, and everybody's dying of laughter, right? Because he broke with the expectations and in a funny way. Because Toby and Lucifer are kind of two different names. All right, so this is about the range, showing to people, to make, giving students resources that enable them to actually explore the relationship between those, between the genre, like say, for example, persuasive genre, and the way it creates, generates logic, as opposed to comedy sketch and so on. And here I wrote, enabling students to produce, to produce a critically informed text, aware of the cultural impact they construct. Now, what does that mean? We live in a diverse society, in a multicultural society. We have different types of different, pardon me, different types of English, different uh, accents, different symbols, different meaning making. I don't want to use this meaning making word. So, different symbols, different. Uh, ways in which we use these symbols in order to actually manipulate values in order to uh, achieve whatever we want. Now, critically informed doesn't mean actually, well, it does mean respectful, but it doesn't mean uh, deprived of play, right? People can, students can actually play with the with the range use vietnamese ornamentation use vietnamese i don't know whatever use chinese symbols use indigenous ways of uh, thinking of the land and the map and whatever else right students can actually integrate different different symbols different uh, ways of thinking of text and also different ways of um, expressing values in order to produce their text. And this is what I would call informed. And this brings me now to assessment, right? Sorry, it's just about uh, over an hour, but basically brings me to assessment. If you, in your resource, when you want to, and remember this thing here, when you want to, create the engagement phase, which is the first one. And when you want students to be inspired by the different things that people do, you want them to explore text, explore different tools of analysis, of text analysis and so on. They actually learn, before they actually get to the point when they actually do the project, right, which is the evaluation, the summarizing findings and identifying, the project before they get to the actually project phase they learn a lot in the engagement phase and this actually runs counter to what you will see in schools to what you will say probably anywhere the reason for it is that a lot of uh, ways of teaching students how to teach and you know how you will be mentored or are mentored in schools are based on the past and in the past, basically, engagement was really hurried. People didn't think of engagement as including all that range that I have discussed with you, so that students now can inform, in fact, participate in the process of defining their projects and what the project will involve. That's not done so it's okay if you feel bad about it you haven't seen it anywhere but 
look, I'm working with the curriculum, I'm an academic, I want to work with the curriculum as the curriculum requires, not as I know things are done in schools or had been done in schools 20 years ago or whatever. And now I know that a lot of times, um, say even in Hattie's work, uh, people actually complain what, about what's done in schools and people, you know, but I have actually been in different states and sure, some teachers are still very conservative and maybe many are, but I have seen also amazing things happen, right? So it's not like everybody is doing all these boring things. But anyway, so what I wanted to say is that the engagement phase is actually a rich phase. It's the phase where children actually explore the world. And we, I, I have uh, shown you that in order to explore in relation to what the curriculum wants, there's a lot of us for us to consider in order to include that in the, in the materials. And in, the for, and in the tools for analysis that we make uh, available to students. Now, in assessment, because, because you made all of this available, right? All of this available and, and, students, and students were engaged in different forms of analysis and considered different um, different ways of looking at the world through these uh, different experiences. When children get to the point when they actually, that's why I call it also evaluation, when they actually have to identify the project, this is for you a form of analysis, of, of assessment, because as, as students with you identify the project, identify objectives, I have actually explore, explained in a different PowerPoint or somewhere uh, in module four, what questions are involved and what to do. So when you actually go with children or with students through those uh, questions, you actually get a pretty good idea. It's a formative assessment, right? You get a pretty good idea of how much they uh, remember, how much they actually were um, impacted by the uh, engagement phase. It gives you also then some clues of what to make better, um, for future, it's ongoing, it never ends, just like my ELA 200, every semester, just different, 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 it's all ongoing, and the same for you, and I don't get bored with it because I get, my mind gets uh, enriched by the fact that I can actually provide more tools and, uh, and so on, and the same for you, for teachers, if you engage in your teaching as a researcher, as an inspiration for you in order to inspire others, you will never be sick of it. Right, so uh, regarding assessment, your rich, your rich analysis of what reading to others involves. And therefore, if you want to inspire children towards activities that involve them in some form of reading to others, then you need to consider what needs to be present for them. Now you need to you need to consider what you make you have to make available for them what kinds of understandings and tools of analysis you have to actually provide and you notice it's quite a lot and yes it is we can't actually develop a complex person from them reading a line in the book and understanding or uh, words as if they were dictionary entries so so there so we have we have an, exp an engagement phase. We have now explored how to work with the curriculum and what to consider in order to actually produce resources or make 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 uh, stud make, uh, make to students make particular materials available to students and particular tools so that they can develop a richer understanding of the world around them, get inspired, see that doing amazing things is possible because through the engagement phase, as they were going, they were learning a lot already. So they feel now pretty much empowered to do amazing things, even if they are only five. And so, um, so, so much about assessment. I know it's, you, you may think it's not, not a lot, but it is a lot about assessment. So what you do, you do your analysis of the activity, in my, in my view is, so whatever activity you picked, 
you make activities you 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 enable students to actually experience the multi-dimensional aspects of that activity students explore them students develop an understanding of what they would do as their project and in that context of students defining their project as you go through questions and uh, you actually that gives you opportunity to do formative assessment and you actually can assess how much of what you actually made available and st what students explored was visible in their responses to you about the project that they want to do now uh, so that and a couple of things remember uh, do not think it's silly whatever i have produced here then i have given you also links to uh, oh yeah what's that um i don't know what it is uh where's my avatar anyway i don't know something happened there should be an avatar here um i have given you some examples of how to use technology and again they're different and remember so that's the avatar so you can i'll show you the link soon but you should have access to some technology links like the avatar here so that's the link i didn't know so that's the link to the avatar. So it gives you here. Um, so you have that explained in some of the videos that I showed earlier, how to work with it in the classroom with five-year-olds, pre-service children, pre, pre, pardon me, <laughs> pre-literacy pre -literacy children. So they can actually, they so it, it just um it, it just will um uh have to watch that yourselves because there's not enough time in that video so google translate already explained and this one i have explained so you've got some links here to different things you even have some game i invented and so on do have a look it's very much or or at least keep for yourselves for your future these links and these um, understandings of how to work with those resources. So here's Avatar explained how to work with Avatar. Um, anyway, when you look at how to work with, how to design a unit of work, part one and part two, I do explain the things. I also think that you will find very useful activities here with designing um, empowering activities, you have a look about reading. So all of this is about how to actually not just structure a unit of work, but how to integrate those uh, reading activities that we have covered through um, YouTube videos that I have posted a couple of weeks ago and the collaborate session um, on Friday last week, which is on the 6th of May a little bit today and also throughout the semester. This one is very interesting, uh, which is Joe Humphrey's PowerPoint. So this will, so please explore it. I have actually worked with it already in one of our podcasts, but um, you might want to re uh, refresh your memories. All right, so, so much for today. And we from now on move on to the discussion board where we need to actually bring it in, translate it all into practice and see how students are actually working with all that. Okay, thank you very much.